Thank you, everyone, for joining Did You Know, the ESCO HVAC Show. It's Nikki Lester from ZSpace. How are you? Great. Great to be here. Thank you. So we're all aware that the world is changing, technology is changing, and the ways that we consume information are definitely taking some learning curves. And for many of us that uh, are fairly new to education or have been in education and haven't adapted to new technologies, there are a lot of things that can be very intimidating when we start talking about technology in general. I mean, many of us, I take like for myself, when I came out of the field to go teach again, I had to relearn things like PowerPoints and I had to learn so many spreadsheets. And then now it's like, okay, you gotta put on a set of Oculus goggles. And I go, a pair of who for what? And so there's all of these different technologies that have changed. And a lot of people don't understand the differences between augmented reality and virtual reality and how these are really playing into the education role. They're not new to the industry at all. They're just fairly new for us. And uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to break some of these misperceptions of what technology can do in our classrooms. So uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Nikki. All right, so let me bring this up. I'll put us over here on the side so we can really focus in on the content. So tell us a little bit more about ZSpace and what the concept does and how it plays into the educational environment. Sure. Well, we're ZSpace. So ZSpace.com is our website and we offer what you see in front of you, a platform of virtual augmented and virtual reality, right? And it's kind of a blend of both, which is hence where you get the Z space. So kind of from the X and Y axis, that ah. mid in intermediary Z space, which was always the stuff that was more intangible and things that we couldn't touch or really actually prove. We now have a platform where students or users can sit in front of that and engage with this platform where things will literally, like you see in the in picture, come out at them. And one of the things that I'd like to mention, if you saw the before where they were talking about on the news where the students had on glasses and they were yeah. able to put on glasses and then see this magic happen. Well, what you see in front of you, that was our first platform or our earlier platform. Right. And right now we have what's called Inspire and that is a laptop version. And what's happening with that is we've hmm. actually removed the glasses as well. And now it transitions into our Z space environment when you launch an application and by the magic of the cameras that are up on the top of that screen, it helps transition. And by looking at your eyeballs and seeing that driver sitting in front of the computer with our stylus, it then transitions into this space for this 3D imagery. And what we find from this is a really experiential learning for students, whereas a textbook was flat or we have yeah, lecture exactly. capabilities, this now becomes to life. Okay. And so part of where we go is here you can see some of our technology landscape and what people are really probably most familiar with is that HMD or virtual reality. Yeah, exactly. Um, hopefully, people have gotten a chance to at least experience. It is a great, great mm -hmm. way to be able to swim with sharks, do some different things. It's, it's limited into its capacity just because of size, but there is a great exploration. I'm a prior diesel mechanic before my, awesome. um, before my teaching days. And so in here, there's a great auto collision type of program. You know, you get down on your hands and knees and you're actually feeling as though by putting on this um, piece of equipment that you're actually taken into a place where it, everything surrounds you. Okay, so, so that's, lots that's of our dimension. Reality. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, and that's what I think a lot of us are more familiar with. Uh, you know, I learned from my son who had brought out you know a game you know using an Oculus and brought into that realm. I thought, oh wow, this is this is really intriguing. But it's really kind of progressed even much further than that, hasn't it? It, it has, and, and it's blended and, and doing lots of different things. In the next space we have augmented reality, yeah. and a lot of people, even if you've thought that you've never touched any of these types of landscapes, a lot of people we're finding don't really know that they are. A right. lot of cell phone capabilities, such as Ikea, if you're shopping, for instance, you now can take a picture of a piece of furniture. And if you have a picture of your home, there's, there's a way that it interprets this and now puts that piece of furniture in your home. That now is augmented reality. You're taking okay. things into your space and, right. and putting them there. Um, and so again, just a different platform of reality. Okay, so we're we're utilizing a visual that we're already comfortable with and adding a new layer of visual on top of that. Uh, okay, so that was kind of the piece that I was missing from it. Uh, you know, I was first introduced to this at our own conference this year, and I had no idea how 
intriguing this was. You couldn't even get to the booth. I mean, it was there were so many people that were curious of what was going on. And from a distance, you're like, man, what? I really want to see what's going on, but couldn't quite get there. So I'm, I'm very anxious to be able to witness some of this myself because it's used in a lot of educational platforms, especially in that K through 12, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We've been around in the space of education for about 10 or 11 years now. Okay. Um, we started more on the K, K8, K12 STEM, STEAM science side of things yes. and have now expanded into universities, technical schools, medical schools, because we also have a range of career and techni technical education applications as well. But going back to this slide, what, what ZSpace does well is it's taking kind of a blend and mentioning that X and Y access. The Z space is taking a mixed reality and putting some of both of those worlds into that computer space for you. Okay. So versus having to put on a headset or, you know, do any different things like that, you have one computer you can sit in front of and then those images come out at you. Also, by having the capability of re removing a, another peripheral that, you know, again, sometimes where we have motion sickness, we don't right. really have a lot of that reported back to us because here you're still engaged. And in, a, in an educational classroom, for instance, mm -hmm. it doesn't breed disruption because as soon as I look away from my magic of what's happening on my Z space, I can be re-engaged with that instructor at the front of the room. In here in other aspects, platform. I have different technology pieces that I might yeah. have to remove or remove from you know my area to be able then to re-engage and have that, that direct connection back with the instructor. Okay, that really adds a significant layer because one of the complaints that I have heard with augmented reality is, you know, over a period of time, if that's the only thing you're seeing, there's almost a, like a mental separation because you're, it's like, a, like if we think about like a computer, you know, it's all inputs and outputs. Think like a control board for a furnace, air conditioner, heat, whatever. It's inputs and outputs. And like with just augmented alone, it's an input, but you don't have an output. You're not actually relating it to something that you're, you've already perceived. Whereas when you blend the two, you're, you're just putting a layer on top of something that you're already familiar with and that is that is a very intriguing perspective on this whole multi-dimensional atmosphere that is you know growing around us right yeah very cool so there are a few characteristics here and i won't i won't read all of these to you but it kind of mm -hmm. breaks it down a little bit further uh, especially on an educational level here again fully immersive that can do different things on an educational side good bad and different you you know again different technology spaces. Yep. And I will always say as a prior educator, if we can scaffold any type of learning, there's not one tool that that is no. the best fit for all. We, we know this, there are different learning styles, different people. So there are yep. different tools that can do different things. And you know, money is always a factor. I get that. But the more that you can give different different pieces different to options students to be able to have different experiences that's right. an important that's an important tool so again unique experience here for each learner whereas we're more of a collaborative piece but that could be very something very um, important if you're going through and wanting those particular aspects if you go on to the next slide here again augmented reality and i just find it really funny snapchat is one of those augmented realities uh, and i sure. know you saw yeah um, but snapchat a lot of my older generations feel as though they they've never touched any of this but yet a lot of them have cell phones <laughs> and know. yet they've put on the little character you know noses and ears yeah. that, that is yeah. your augmented reality right you're placing okay real world you're you're in your real world but you're Integrating placing the content in with you yeah 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 that that's like one of the big struggles we have when we start talking about new technologies you know so many people go ah i'm, I'm not ready to switch that new technology and we go do you realize you play with it every day and you just don't know it you know technology yeah. is in our world there's not a person that i know can say that they don't have a smartphone of some form or another that use it for something other than a telephone right that you know, is true. that started out as a telephone that is now a multi-purpose tool and and these are just tools that we're using to connect with our audience, connect with our students particularly. Absolutely. Yeah. For those that are joining, is anyone already implementing augmented reality or virtual reality into your classrooms? Uh, classrooms. I'm sorry. We, uh, we're really curious. And let us know where you're chiming in from. It's always good to know where uh, everyone is at today. So finally here, just to break down the, some of the characteristics specifically for ZSpace. It does mix both of those in, in different areas. We do want it to be collaborative. There is very specifically one driver, the one driver because of the cameras, they are the ones who are holding the stylus. But for our students, they'll gather around 
you know, you can sit in here, the students can see the screens. There's yeah. really nothing. And our younger generation lives a lot in these environments already because, oh, yeah. you know, if you raise your, if you ask a class usually, and you're like, how many of my gamers or how, how many of you are in virtual? Over half of them always raise their hands, yeah, right? Absolutely. Whether it's kindergarten all the way up through my university students, you find that they're just in these environments. And so to put some of this in education, we're just bridging that gap, right, of where we're meeting them. But we'll also see in a minute where we're also helping with the workforce as well. Okay. You know, I can think back about the first time that I was introduced to augmented reality and didn't actually understand it and was blown away. The, the first time that I seen the stargazing app where you ever used that? Yes. At, yeah. At nighttime and you're looking at the sky and your, your phone is, is putting all of these, you know, astrological projections on your screen. You go, wow, that's a pretty amazing thing. And then think about, well, yeah, that was seven or eight years ago. So I can only fathom how much that has adapted as we've moved along. Absolutely. And so just to preface this video, this is um, uh, just a quick clip from our CEO that really does a great job of kind of giving you who is ZSpace? Sure. Who are we? What do we do? So if you'd like okay. to go ahead and play that. Mm -hmm. The computing experience has been unchanged since the introduction of the mouse and touch screen in the 1980s. This created an inherent limitation. The screen can be a barrier to content, discouraging engagement and hampering creativity and learning. ZSpace was founded to eliminate that barrier between content and user experience, just as Apple did with smartphones and Tesla did with electric cars. We did this through a range of innovations in hardware and software. These innovations have eliminated the barrier between digital content and people so that they can be immersed in content. Touch it, experience it, and interact with it as if it were real. Today, we are recognized as a leader in the eduverse where we are breaking learning barriers, equity barriers, and workforce barriers in the global education market. Our proprietary innovative technology facilitates immersive experiential learning experiences across science, technology, engineering, and workforce applications. Our solutions improve outcomes and efficacy from K-12 classrooms to continuing and technical education or workforce development settings. ZSpace's immersive AR VR technology unites education with the metaverse, providing students with equitable access to innovative, engaging learning experiences. In fact, ZSpace has been deployed in 94% of the top 100 school districts in the United States and has been used for workforce applications in 73% of these school districts, emphasizing the dexterity of our platform for learners across various classroom settings. Our technology has been used by millions of learners around the world, with the benefits backed by evidence, including significant test score improvement and greater social and emotional learning, or SEL, teaching students soft skills, such as persevering through failure and developing confidence. However, this is only the beginning. ZSpace is committed to expanding across the entire learning spectrum and providing next generation experiential learning to the workforce around the world. That's crazy. <laughs> and so when we talk about these emerging technologies and the, the youth that are growing up with these in their hands in all sorts of different curriculums, it just makes sense to bring it into our own curriculum and adapt that new form of technology. So such a cool experience. Yeah, it's... Um... Every day I'm kind of wowed by the stuff that I get to do and, and get to see with students. So um, we uh, I, I actually was integrating ZSpace as I left my district. I spent 16 years, eight of which I was a teacher and uh, in the classroom at the high school. And then the other eight, I was the career and tech ed director for District 49 right outside of right in Falcon, Colorado. Oh, sure. Um, and so here um, this this has a little clip behind it. But yeah. but really, um, I'm not sure if you can show it, but yeah, I've got what, a little what, video to go. Awesome. Okay. So, so going back to me kind of being an educator, right? People ask, well, why Z space? Yeah. Well, there are some definite reasons on the workforce side, but, but for education, right? Yep. I used to have 12 schools. Um, we were about 30,000 strong school mm -hmm. district. And with those 12 schools, I had multiple pathways at each school. And when you're, when you're trying to do all of these things with students and give them some of these real practical types of um, experiences, 
danger can really be an issue, right? Sure. So, oh, electrical and yeah, high voltages. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, what, yeah. <laughs> how do we teach how to work on a you know compressor, especially these inverters that run in 300 plus volts DC? You know, I'm not sure that I want to introduce that into a first year, you know, in high school as a junior, you know, these uh, these pieces of technology. But if I can introduce a technology in a safe and harmless way, oh, well, that changes everything. Right. So, so we work with, and, and, and right here you see a term called DICE, right? Yes. And this experience on demand, we work with a professor, Jeremy Balenson up at Stanford, and he's the renowned VR specialist. Um, and, you know, educators need data. So we're constantly yeah. trying to find data because it is newer technologies, right? You need to know what's happening to students, about students, why students, for students, all of all of those things, right? Even in the longevity. So anytime we can partner with people for, you know, the research components, all of those things to help drive the data behind that, again, that helps this full circle with the education process. Yeah. But what he helped us coin was a term called DICE. And what we do in our space, um, in our Z space, on mm -hmm. our Inspire platform, is we can help do things to remove the danger. We can help do things that are impossible, counterproductive and or expensive. And so if if you can play that clip, yeah, it'll just show us just some things from some of our different applications. Right. Because we cover a gamut from kindergarten all the way up through industry, the sciences, the CTE. So in here, there are a few different applications. And if we can, if yeah, we see I, that. Yeah, I'll bring that in here for us. Absolutely. Awesome. So here, the danger kind of represents engines, wow. right? Or just as it was mentioned with electricity, what we're facing right now for some of the danger is even in automotive, the electric and hybrid vehicles. I used to work on a 24 volt system in the in the military on yeah. diesel equipment. Sure. And now you're pushing 650 volts, right? So to go back to your point of introducing types of things for students, that becomes a real, real problem. The impossible Right there, I had a physics um, application, so I can show gravity on different planets. Sure. My counterproductive shows you kind of putting and moving barriers for different, um, going over like a longevity of 100 years. What would putting in different barriers, different types of forestry or different types, how does that protect our land, right? So that's counterproductive. Or I could even go into dice dissections, right? Sure. I have an application where you can dissect a frog or a beluga whale or a rattlesnake or any of your common types of, you know, specimens also. But what it does is it those cuts, you can do things over and over because what we know from students is we don't always get things the first time. Right. There are a lot of students that, I mean, even as adults. Absolutely. Need I need to do this a few times before, That's especially right. the older we get, I need to do it even more times. <laughs> That's right. So those specimens, right? When we talk about counterproductive, can we do things in here in this space? Now, I'm not saying necessarily remove the practical, right? Yeah. But there are 13 states right now that take virtual dissections, for instance, because uh, wow, of religion yeah. or because of other aspects. Sure. And does every student have to dissect? That is a conversation for different educators at different levels, you know, but again, if we have to do this or you get to this, can every student do it first here, get a great understanding so that yeah. when they do cut on that frog or that specimen, that it becomes a realer piece of what they've done and they understand what they're really doing. Yeah. Because they've brought it from almost a tangible piece here, right? It wasn't tangible, but it was probably almost the best thing that we can get outside of having that practical experience. And then finally, the expensive piece, <laughs> you saw a cadaver in there. And I used to oversee a medical academy. And so we had high school students who were going for CNA. They were concurrent enrollment, all of those types of things that you hear in education. Yep. We were doing that. And one, I bought $6,000 worth of cow brains or cow eyes for them right. to dissect, right? That practical experience. Well, that came in, that box of, of parts Specials. came in and sat mm -hmm. on the loading dock all weekend. Those students did not have that experience because those parts were ruined. Yeah, and absolutely. in education, I couldn't just say, "Here's another six thousand dollars. Yeah. Can you please? Can we please do this?" Okay, again? we we'll put a rush order on those. Let's exactly. Add another five hundred dollars next day delivery. Exactly. Yeah. It's just not a possibility. So no. in here, I can guarantee with my space that the student will have the same experience 
every day, day in, day out, the next student over as long as there's a computer because it will let them do and they can push a button just to reset if they make a mistake. Oh, Again, wow. as human beings, we don't we don't get enough capabilities today no. to be able to make mistakes to learn from them. Uh, just to, you know, take a simple task like connecting a condenser fan motor. I would love the opportunity to be able to have a student do this a few times and let the smoke out digitally without actually having to burn some motors up in the classroom. I can only just fathom the amount of opportunities that arise from Wow. All right. Um, <laughs> and I want to say thank you for everyone that's joining us. Uh, Thomas Tebby, we appreciate you joining. Luciano from Brazil, thank you so much for joining us internationally. Uh, Anthony in Charleston, South Carolina. Renee Tomlinson, thank you so much for hanging out with us, Renee. Uh, just great opportunities to look at technology from a different perspective and, and put it in a tool. Well, think about when we were in the field. If we were if we were technicians before we became educators, how many tools did we work with on a daily basis? Right. When we get in the classroom, it's about making sure that we we have the proper tools for managing our new scenario. So, man, you, you really got me interested in this now. <laughs> it's opening Super up some. Cool, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, it is opening up a, a whole different level of thought process that uh, I haven't quite been to yet. Hmm. Well, and we can talk all day long about why it's great for education. But, you know, on the flip side, we know that those young educators will eventually hit the workforce. Yes. Right? So there's lots of different goals that that we all have in getting them prepared to do that. So in some of, again, the research, some of the studies of what it's showing is using some of these trainers. They are learning four times faster right than regular traditional, you know, traditional classroom methods. Especially. So even in industry, you're seeing this as a training method yeah. that now is becoming on site for all age users because they know it's capable. You don't have to, I just ran into a woman at the HVAC conference who she has all of her, her parts, all of her pieces, all of her training components that she literally has to take from place to place. Like yeah. if they want to train them correctly, they need a boiler. So they need a room. They need, if they could upload and put things like this in this space to be able to use as a trainer, now you have a tool of a computer that you have to basically lug around or ship around versus hmm. having a training facility. Thousands right? of pounds of material being traveled and hauled around the country. Oh yeah, that that's one of the reasons many of our manufacturers do not have mobile training facilities is because of the cost of transportation. It's a lot of weight to bring, yeah, like a boiler. Say if we want to do a boiler class, how are you going to bring a boiler to a classroom to teach on? And then you're going to yeah. have all of the utilities connect to it. So it's a very expensive task to have mobile training facilities until now. Basam, thank you for joining us. Uh, let us know where you're joining us from, too. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here with us today. Yeah. Wow. I like this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we talk about, you know, again, there's some of the studies that show why, right? But where we're seeing some of the uses of virtual and augmented reality are in some of these areas within the workforce, right? So again, that full circle piece of education to workforce, we know that it's being used in medical. I, during the pandemic, there was a young man, um, we were working with Renton College out of Washington mm -hmm. and there was a professor, they were doing automotive. And there was a young man up in there who was in the program and they they literally got our laptops. And during the pandemic, the students came by, they picked them up and they just went on. Right. This was during the closure period. So they went home and, you know, the student reported back like, oh, my gosh, this was how I learned in the military. And I was like, Professor, please go find out what what's going on. I've not been in the military since 95. So, right. please, you know, please, please explain. Yeah, fill in so a little this, bit here. Yeah, this young gentleman based through the professor, he he basically said that he had been special forces and his training environment in CONUS, which means in United States, right? right. When he was Top here, United States. his yep. entire training was done in these types of realities, right? I've heard a lot we, of that. Yeah, he was a weapon specialist. Now, sure. again, good, bad, or indifferent of how you feel about that. He was right. he's protecting our country, serving our country. But, but in CONUS, he never touched anything tangibly. He worked in these environments, in the augmented virtual reality environments, right behind our space in yeah. different different modalities. And he would work and learn those weapons and weapon systems. When he deployed, he then encountered those weapons and weapon systems, right? 
Yeah, physically. In in reality. Yeah. And after I would as, I, I I assume because of special forces, he had to have been in at least six years, and I think yeah. he was about twenty eight now at the time because I still call him a kid. But um, <laughs> yeah. he's in a I've program a now. <laughs> right, well, he's in a program now after serving the military, and yeah. he's still alive. Right. And exactly. being a weapon specialist and being in those types of environments, if if it's you're rough. not if you're not it, like if that doesn't make a connection, just think of the special forces and what he was doing as equivalent to a Navy, a Navy SEAL, right? Yeah. Some of those covert operations going into different places um, securely, you know, covertly and all of that and getting out and, and being successful at his missions and saving people or saving assets or, you know, maybe taking out assets. I, I don't know the full capacity. He c- couldn't talk about those things. But my biggest point is, is if this is how we're training people for our workforce, in, in the military and in some of these other components, this lot. is something that the students are going to see again, right? Mm. So I was a big proponent in, in when I was a career and tech ed director, don't give me your antiquated equipment. Give me what is being used now because you want me to yes. have the students with the best <laughs> skills available. And by the way, your students coming out the door a lot of times don't, yeah. people don't realize the workforce outside of age requirements, your students have time. Right. So my IT kids, my my skilled trades kids, they if you hook them and you get them excited, they will learn everything. And then they are, they are that much more capable of being your sponge because yes. when we become adults and we try to change careers or try to go do better for ourselves, we have lots of life stuff. Right. So it's just a different capacity where, again, full circle give them the tools, try to bridge the gap. This is where they're living anyway in their gaming. And if you really want to hook them and engage them in you their world. It. Again, I'm not t- I'm not saying that, you know, education and the way it's been done is not necessarily wrong, but we just have to change and adapt. And we definitely see a different generation because they have different tools and we have to find different ways to make those tools accessible and utilizable and equatable for all of them to be able to have to make that full circle for when they do get into the workforce. You know, one of the comments that just came in, and it is an interesting question, and, and I wonder if there's even enough time for evaluation. It, has there been any studies on the retention of content of VR in comparison to, say, traditional learning methodologies? Um, I don't, there, there are some studies out there. What we do know is because it is an engagement and experiential type of learning, we do know that it, it, it hooks into that deeper understanding and that recall capability. Yeah, exactly. We have students who talk to their teachers and we get feedback all the time. I saw that engine in the middle of the night and I could recall. So, cause visually they can recall almost right in front of them. I they- want to see it myself right now. After seeing it, I'm going, I, if I was going think about how much time people are on their phones in the evenings, right? That we look at some of our Gen Zers, whether they will admit it or not, many of them six to 10 hours a day are on some type of digital technology. Why not give them that opportunity? I, I want to see the inside of that engine again. You know, if I had that to be able to do in the evening instead of scrolling through nonsense, by golly, you might have something to really keep you entertained. Educational yeah. entertainment. I, mm. I don't have the studies in front of me, unfortunately, but there no. there are some. I will always say that it, the studies are always behind the curve only because yeah. we just technology moves so quickly. Oh, but yeah. They are doing a good job of trying to keep up with that. And again, going back to the workforce, it's, it's working, obviously, because there's a lot of different workforce components that have already integrated, right? Right. Um, we talk about the design side. They're doing prototyping. They're doing a lot of things in these worlds already. Um, that here, this is Tesla, right? So again, you can skip to the next slide. So Tesla designing of vehicles, um, here again, the training, the remote maintenance, um, we, we went through a pandemic. So what can be done socially distanced, right? But lots, lots of different things for these different types of spaces, but it's bringing that reality and that it doesn't, There are some things that you can remove the practical pieces from. Just like I said, this young gentleman, he'd never touched anything. Eventually he did. Right. right? And and there are some there are some that you do need, again, to scaffold. You start here, you integrate, you're doing with, you know, you're. Yeah. And and you do touch because being a diesel mechanic, I, I feel as though, you know, it's a really unfair statement to say, like, there are some really heavy 
components on in diesel equipment. <laughs> I needed to know that as a female. Right. I also needed to know like busting my knuckles, what yeah. that felt like. Yeah. Now we only can comes with experience. <laughs> right. Well, we can transition to say that, you know, some of those skilled trades are not always necessarily going to be dirty like we used to think though either, because yeah. with the usage of these technologies, right now you've got you've got troubleshooting for some of the networking probably that's happening over Tesla, right? Where some of your auto auto technicians may never physically touch a car. They may just push stuff out over the web. They may diagnostically, you know, Maybe the technical oh, support side of things. Yeah, yeah technical support, people. troubleshooting. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So just it, different ways to think about our processes of what's happening. If you go to the next slide, here again, just going back, augmented reality, reality, reality technology for military dogs, right? Uh, again, you're seeing lots of different different types of things happen within these spaces. Um, you know, another one right now that's really big and hot is AI. You know, oh, again. Man. Bridging all of these types of and, and research, lots of research, lots of studies, um, but the technology is just quickly, quickly moving and expanding into lots of different areas. Yeah, and that's why we bring this into our show to help people understand that technology is changing, you know, in many aspects, not just the uh, technology that's in the equipment, but the technology that is in the diagnostic tools and now in the training tools. You know, why would we not? embrace technology. We embrace technology in everything that we do in life. And for us in the HVAC industry, we're an unusual breed. We we tend to like to hang on to some of the legacy and tradition. And in many aspects, that's a wonderful thing. But when it comes to where is the world going around us and how do we stay up with many other industries that are moving forward, we have to think outside of the box and we have to be practical. I mean, think about this. If we're teaching anatomy with this technology to K through eight, why wouldn't we also be using it to teach basic electricity in K through eight, let alone in the rest of us who are going to appreciate this technology as well? Mm. All right. Uh, let me upload. Oh, yeah. Let me grab this one real quick. So this is um, an instructor at Pickens Technical College here in Aurora, Colorado, and um, our HVAC applications are relatively newer on our space, sure. um, but he was one of the first ones at the college level to, to integrate. And this is just a few comments from him, from what we've, what we've gathered. Z-Space is going to help them have an understanding of what they're doing and why we do it. This is an old filter dryer that we had, and it's been in the program for years and years. Z-Space has taken it and opened it up and shown me how it works. They get to see the vapor coming in, picking up the moisture and coming out. Z-Space is a good stepping stone for them to be successful. So true. I mean, just the opportunity to learn about something and see it internally. What if, the, I mean, that's great that it's a cutaway filter dryer. That's the way I teach filter dryers. What if you don't have one? What if it's a bi-flow filter dryer for a heat pump and it's got check valves inside of it and you go, check valves inside of this and you can actually take a 3D portion and go, yeah, let me take this off and, oh, looky here, this is what we're talking about without actually having to go through the you know, the potential hazards of running it through a bandsaw and, you know, cutting things open, having sharp edges. Well, and as you uh, mentioned, he had to weld that out, right? And yeah. and as multiple HVAC instructors, as well as manufacturers and even automotive, they've had to make a lot of their own trainers. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Either they weren't available, they were, you know, again, and, or it's one board, right? You put one board on the wall, a couple students can do that. Um, one cutaway, again, expensive costs to yep. do one and purpose. time. I mean, right. think, think about how little time we have. You know, our programs are shrinking and the technology is growing. Well, how do we bridge that gap? How do we get the content in? How do we get the hands-on portion? That's the piece that we're all missing. How do we get the hands-on value in the program? Uh, well, can we do it digitally? Can we do it virtually? And that way, when we're doing the physical part, our brains are reconnecting with signals that we've already embedded. Oh, I know what this is. Now I can feel it. We've, we've already used sensory perception. We've already integrated those components. And then we add the physical to it. Our visual is already there. The audible is already there. And so now we can connect our third component and look at it. And now we'll go, oh, now I have some complete intrinsic value because I've connected all of my senses into this component. Absolutely. My 
one of my many bosses was on site um, just last week and he was at a location and this young man was holding a part. He's in a manufacturing course. Um, sure. I, I'm not exactly sure what class it was, but he had a part that wasn't working. And so he he got the part and he was like, we need to find out inside what is like broken inside. so that we could try to replace right. it. And so they went over to the Z space because they had the Z space and that was our prior platform. So you see the students have the glasses on and right. they got right in there and they pulled up the part and because they can make it translucent or they can explode the part with oh. vocabulary terms, right? They were able to find the exact part that they knew yeah. was broken and then order that specific part because it gave them the vocabulary term. And they didn't necessarily have to break down the whole component here to be able to see that, right? Because there's always a danger of breaking down different components that they might not go back together yeah. or, work the or losing it in the amount of time that it takes to get the piece shipped to you. I mean, maybe I've done that before. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I wish, and, and if you have the opportunity to come back or to, to yep. watch this feed later on, because again, I can talk to you all day about what this does and what it looks like, but from a teacher's perspective or from a student's perspective, it's really meaningful. And, and, and it's really an eye opener when you see students get excited or oh, when man. you cook them and they take something like this and they're like, hey, I've got a problem. Well, let's take a look because we can go solve that problem. And they take their own initiative and then they go out and they solve that problem. So as educators, that is really what we want, right? We want them to to hook, to, to do some of their own wanting to learn, to continue to want to learn, Absolutely. to go down those paths. So that's, you know, that's a great way that, that ZSpace helps to do a lot of that. Great opportunity to stop and ask, does anyone have any questions at this point? Because that's a lot to consume if this is your first introduction into the blended uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. It kind of is for me. I mean, I've, I've been aware of them, but not in this capacity. This is incredibly intriguing. I did oh, see yeah. a question about if they would like to use it in the classroom in South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah, let me bring that up. There's Anthony. So uh, just, just to address that, um, Anthony, so out on zspace.com, our website is wonderful, wonderful. And I'm glad you have this slide up. So zspace.com is there, that, that's the website. Um, if on the, on the homepage, you can scroll all the way to the bottom and it will say, contact us. And that will then you can put in your name and that will send you and it will get sent to your area regional director who will make contact with you so that you can start to set up and have a conversation or we can jump online and do a demo or we come to you. Lots of different things that can happen from there. But once you get out to zspace.com, um, the, the slide that we see right here are, is an example of some of our applications that we do support on our platform. Oh, so wow. our platform is that magic platform. At the end of the day, I didn't mention it is just a Windows PC. It is a Windows 11 PC that we run from with special cameras and magic that's built into yeah, it. Sure, the proprietary, but, yeah. Yeah, so so you do need the hardware. I, I do want to make that clear. We are a hardware software. We are a full package. We offer lots of different help and support, the professional development, all of those things. But I did want to stress you do need our hardware right now because yeah. it is special with those cameras. But when it's not in Z space mode, it does become a Windows PC. So you could use it for everything, not just a standalone Z space magical machine. Okay. So those so outside of the windows 11 that icons that you see here i I'm, i always say do we have an icon for that do we have an app right. for that <laughs> those little pictures are indicative of the different applications now this is not all of them this is just a, a handful of what we do have to offer so under zspace.com we have a tab called product and under there you can go under applications by clicking on any one of these icons, it will give you a good information base. It will take you to that page and tell you exactly what that application does for you. So okay. for instance, the green V on there is vivid science. So when we talk about dissecting, I can dissect I can dissect something from microbiology. I can dissect right. things from your zoology. I have earth science in there. So again, that will give you kind of that deeper dive. And we have some really great videos out there also that give you kind of that short little demo experience to give you an overview of what that application does and has in it. So um, things from healthcare all the way through culinary and again, heavy on the K-16 through, right. you know, through sciences as well. Um, but then in our CTE areas, we also do some career exploration and things like that too. 
One of the questions that just came in, and it is an intriguing one, uh, could a technician, so if they had the subscription and they had the PC and they were out in the field, could they utilize the software in the field on a remote connection? So yes, it's portable. It's portable. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I will tell you is if you, so as the Windows machine, you can use it anywhere you want. Yep. However, with the Z space, if you're using our software, or using that environment, we do just have to watch the direct sunlight aspect of it because with the cameras and with the integration of the stylus, there are like the infrared types of communication. Oh, yeah, absolutely, possible. which could be interfered with. Yeah, I could see right. that. Right, you don't have to be in dark. You right. don't, you know, go in a classroom and those types of things. Yeah. But if we're sitting outside and direct sunlight was hitting yeah. it, that might be, you know, I that might that. be an issue. Oh, yeah. for sure. But indoors, I mean, it just opens up those opportunities. You know, I spent about five years as a mobile engineer. And so my tool back, and I still actually use it quite often, is three-fourths tools. And then the back compartment was for my laptop. You know, it's because I was using it for all my applications. And to think about that is, you know, if I was a technician and say I was working on a, you know, on a motor, uh, we're... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm in the field and I'm stuck and I have the opportunity to open up and roll around and look and go, am I missing a screw here? My, what is this wire? Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, man, it becomes a an additional training and service tool at the same time. Well, and even into the educational space, I did see at one point, um, again, lots of different ways to deploy, but yeah. I saw in workings where two students were working on a laptop and they were taking apart the engine through our automotive uh, mechanic application. Yep. And another two students were actually physically at the engine and they were all collaborating Talking about together. how oh. they were taking apart. Now, oh, again, yeah. this was a laptop in a shop. Right. So, you know, you have to you have to have some some awareness that there is a computer in a shop. But again, I, I we've seen a lot of different things. Oh my a gosh. I, I, I think about it like a large reciprocating compressor. You know, it, when you go to a compressor teardown class, you know, a lot of people get stuck with the two cylinders and they want to work on the six cylinders because there's only one of the six cylinder, you know, to tear apart. And there's lots of little two cylinders. Um, wow. It just expands the, the training capabilities. Yeah. Uh, okay. Got my vote. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Um, are, so one of the questions that came in, are there any commercial applications for HVAC for larger components like chillers and towers? So right now um, we are working with a company called LabTech. Right now we have HVAC uh, fundamentals and residential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of components of commercial in there that, that represent a couple of modules that, that flow over. But for the most part, um, it's not on the commercial side yet. I am waiting to see if there is a commercial um, application. Demand. Yeah. I did just get, I, I'm one of the first ones that gets to see some of our new software because nice. we do have That's software a cool place that to is homegrown. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's super cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have software that is homegrown, but we also yeah. have third party software. Oh, okay. And yeah. So when we do see things sometimes like in the headset that makes sense in this educational arena, yeah. right? You have one computer versus lots of different heads, all sorts of different reasons, but yep. Um, if we find good applications from third parties that make sense to port over to integrate, because we yeah. work in the Unity environment, right. um, we do bring on those applications. So we are looking for things um, like that constantly. Mm. I did just get a um, sustainable energy uh, with some solar and some wind, I believe. Oh, I still have nice. yet to look at it. Yeah. But again, things like that. So yeah. I would say about if you're interested, about every six months or maybe every three months, check back on our website because we are constantly adding. The other component that I will mention really quickly is mm -hmm. for our industry partners, we do have some spaces and some capabilities depending upon models and things like that, because a lot of people have their own models. This is not a new thing where they've been created in CAD different products, right? Okay, they have their sure. proprietary models for their systems and their things that they use for their own equipment. Right. We do have some capabilities because of the power of our platform to be able to bridge in and bring in certain models and different things like that. So we're always looking and industry is um, 
it's a newer partner outside of the government, right? Because education took up a big space, but be, mm-hmm. because of the power and the platform and where we're going of the training capacities, we have been approached and asked by a lot of companies for these different types of spaces. So we do have some capabilities. I would say contact us and we just can talk through that um, because again, it's outside of that education realm, but we definitely have a component that's more of uh, you know an interest now on the for industry For custom side. construction, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, nobody call or I got my own things that I got to have a build. <laughs> no, it's wonderful that, you know, we're looking at, you know, developing an industry and bringing all these components in and you know, making that educational opportunity real in different environments. Yeah. It just makes sense. I mean, every, every other industry around us, every other profession has utilized technology. I mean, when's the last time that you went in for a surgery and, you know, you, you didn't have any kind of digital examinations beforehand? It just became part of our normal life. So in our field, in our industry, it's just time for us to be more open, be more receptive to using technology to make us more efficient. So what it all comes down to is becoming more efficient. Man, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Anyone have any questions out there? It's a good opportunity to re-rope. I know a lot of brains are going, oh my gosh, I got to rethink about this a little bit. Um, well, what about contact info? What is the best way? I've got the website. Let me bring that up. I do have QR code for Z Space. If anyone wants to go directly to the Z Space website, just grab a photo of that with your smartphone or grab a screenshot and just zoom into it and you can actually go straight to it from there. This will also hang out in the chat for anyone that's interested. All right. Wow. Wow. Um, a lot going on. What about demonstrations? Uh, where are opportunities for people to see some more demos or videos of the products? So we do a lot of the the conferences, the educational conferences. We do um, sponsor and go in as vendors so mm-hmm. that educators do get to see um, you know, our, our equipment, our platform. Um, if someone contacts us, um, through like that contact uh, form that we yep. just talked about under zspace.com. You can go all the way down to contact and just put in some information. Someone will get in touch with you. And um, what we do is we normally, we make contact. So someone will give you a, probably give you a call or an email and we start that conversation. We can do some blending of remote capabilities. We found that during the pandemic that we have a great resource for instructors. Um, even if your students don't have access to our platform, there's some different ways to be able to help drive some of that teaching and lecturing and, you know, pre-teach and all of those different things that, you know, we just came through a pandemic. So the blended and remote capabilities, um, that's, that's a great piece for us. So if need be, we can start out there. We can get on a Zoom call, show people how it works, do some different things like that. If there is a need um, where we need to come on site and or we do both. So we'll either start via virtual, um, virtual or and or come on site and we actually bring our equipment. So the users, the stakeholders that yeah, because we've been in front of students, teachers, um, people who write the checks, you know, administrators, we've been in front of boards, we go to industry. So again, just being able to be in front because people to talk about it and to show you still does not do it the justice of what you see and what you get from when you sit behind it, right? It is a real sit and get experience type of learning. And so by being to being able to bring it in and show people how it actually works, um, you know, again, you get stakeholders involved and it becomes a much better process. So um, we walk through that process. We do help support the whole purchasing um, life cycle. We, we help with the tech support. Again, we do the professional development um, if needed. And we always, you know, we, we say that's a really good thing. It's not a hard learning curve, but there is a lot just even in this conversation today, there's a yeah, lot. I and there's, see that. there's a lot more that we have that we can talk about. So um, again, we, we consider ourselves a full, a full circle. Um, we are mobile. So we are laptops, but that means you can be mobile or you can be static. We also have a cart capability if need be um, for our educators, you know, from the cow type of purpose of being able to push things around. And from that application page, like I said, you know, we have multiple applications. One machine can run one or it can run all applications. Um, We do have some perpetual software. 
And then for the rest of it, we do live off of a subscription based type of um, operation. So for, for to work with different entities of education. Well, it really brings up a an interesting perspective, an opportunity. It's worth looking at your own school to see if you're utilizing the technology in any other departments where you can add additional license on to even see what it looks like in your own schools. I, yeah, it just opens up a lot of training opportunities. Okay, well, um, man, I, I definitely had to go back myself and relook at some and look for the next opportunity to uh, experience it myself. I know we had one here in Indianapolis that was going on and I missed that opportunity. So I will keep an eye out myself for the next time. And uh, yeah, I Nikki. Do know, yeah, I do know that we're, um, we're going to be at ISTE. ISTE. Okay. So yep. that's a big, a big conference for educators. So just putting that out there, any of your acties yep. um, by state or national, we, we usually try to attend most of the states and have some representation on the ACTE side as well. So um, FETC, any of the, like I said, major national conferences, I go to the HVAC conference. Now, um, this is my second year awesome. i just got finished and we've already planned to attend for our third year cool. um, next year so um that's been a great hit great great conference i have to say that's Thank that's you. we had a lot a of fun for sure so. yeah i said i came by multiple times i just couldn't get up to the booth so that's a good problem to have <laughs> They can be but yep. we have a website so contact right. us please <laughs> i will <laughs> Well, Nikki Lester, thank you so much for joining us. We are grateful and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you so much. And everyone else, we will see you next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show. Make sure to go check out the podcast too. We'll probably download this one and turn it into an additional podcast as well. So go check out Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Podcast on any of your favorite podcast networks. And we will see you again next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you.